Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Maine Audubon's 2024 Legislative Summary. Thank you for joining us. Um, I am here. I am Nick Lund, Advocacy and Outreach Manager, and I am so pleased to announce Chess Gundrum, our Advocacy Director, who will lead you through our wins and challenges from the second session of the 131st Maine Legislature. And without further ado, let me turn it over to Chess. Welcome, Chess. Thanks, Nick. Welcome, everybody. I'm really excited to spend the next hour with you as we talk about some of the uh, many wins, some of the challenges we faced in 2024, and where we'd like to go next. So without further ado myself, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get things going. I think you all should be seeing that all right. Um, backing up a little bit, I know um, some of you have surely joined us before, familiar, um, frequent flyers with Maine Audubon members, supporters, et cetera. But for those of you who might be joining us for the first time, let me just stop and say, um, Maine Audubon is the state's oldest and largest wildlife conservation organization. And we work to conserve wildlife and habitat uh, through education, conservation, and advocacy. And that's what you're here today to hear about. So our advocacy department advocates on behalf of public policies that are in the best interest of Maine's wildlife and our habitat. And we've been doing that since our founding in the early 1900s. Our department works at all levels of government. We work at the local level. Here's um, Nick um, at a table talking about Bird Safe Maine, um, which is a program that's largely Portland based, but can, can and will expand to other local communities to address bird, gla uh, bird glass collisions. The bulk of our work, our advocacy work, happens at the state level. Um, and we also work at the federal level as well. Um, we headed down to DC last fall with, um, for those of you that, um, again, are, are um, frequenters of Maine Audubon and familiar with our work and our staff, you'll notice Doug Hitchcock's in the background, our staff naturalist who's been with us for um, about a decade. and. We went down to DC to talk about the Endangered Species Act turning 50 and the importance of keeping that landmark legislation for wildlife intact, secure, strong, funded, all of the above. So we chatted with our federal delegation. But really the bulk of our work happens at the state level. Our approach is science-based, it's measured, it's inclusive, and it depends on citizen activists like yourselves who have uh, are staying up to date, staying engaged, taking action when we let you know that there's a time to sign a petition or engage with a legislator. All of that is the secret to successful advocacy. And everything we talk about for the next hour does not happen without you engaging with us and being an informed advocate for wildlife. So the first of many thank yous to all of you for the incredible work that you do to help support us. We have a bunch of different focus areas at Maine Audubon, um, just to name a few, climate change, forest habitat stewardship, plastics, clean water, uh, protecting rare threatened endangered species. This is just a few, and we're looking to maybe even expand into other categories as well, but just giving you a flavor for the breadth of our work um, departmentally. Um, and all the work we do, it happens because of you, because of our citizen activists, but it also happens because we work collaboratively with so many different organizations across the state. And we do that in coalition um, and beyond. And some of the coalitions um, you'll see up here, Mainers for Offshore Wind, Maine Audubon is a supporter of thoughtful offshore wind development. It's one of the, the biggest levers we can pull to address climate change. So we work collaboratively with a bunch of folks to help advance that industry thoughtfully. Bird Safe Maine again, Wabanaki Alliance, um, the work to advance tribal rights in the state of Maine. Grow Smart Maine, how are we planning for a future that works for wildlife and for people and, and um, developing in, in thoughtful ways. Um, Land for Maine's future again, lots of different stuff. Um, but this again, just giving a little bit of a flavor of where and how we work. And now what I'm gonna do is back up a year and just spend one slide talking about all of the incredible things that we accomplished in 2023. So in the first session of the 131st legislature, so all our work last year, um, and this isn't everything, this is just a taste of some of our big highlights, our big wins from last session, so that you can really see the full picture of you know what we did in the first session and what we did most recently in the second session. So just 
quickly running through a few. In that first session, we passed legislation, now law, to expand protections to common loons from lead poisoning. And this bill was ceremonially signed by the governor um, in midsummer last year. You'll see Governor Mills there on the far left, Rep Hepler, um, who's an incredible champion for wildlife, um, who's our sponsor, Rep Hassenfuss um, to my left, I'm there on the right side, um, who uh, was also an incredible advocate for this bill. Um, huge success, big priority for Maine Audubon. We also added eight new species to Maine Endangered Species Act list, um, five birds, one bee, one bat, one beetle are now all on the list. And this was the first time that species were added because of climate related impacts to their populations. So really important to do, get them the attention that they deserve. Um, keeping in line with endangered and threatened species, we also passed really important legislation to mitigate impacts from development to endangered and threatened species habitat as well. Um, and because of the wonderful work of a fifth grade class from Old Orchard Beach, we now have a state butterfly. And it was wonderful to work alongside this group as they um, advocated for this, getting us this wonderful um, pink edge sulfur as our state butterfly, which lays their, their caterpillars lay their eggs on um, blueberry bushes. So perfect fit for Maine. Incredible to see um, this group of kids forward this um, important initiative um, for everybody. And we also um, help to secure investments in research and monitoring of wildlife and habitat that um, could and will be impacted by the development of offshore wind. That was a huge big procurement bill you might've heard called if you've been following the clean energy um, work in Maine. And um, address bird glass collisions for state buildings. Nick was really the, um, the lead on this one for us and there's lots of good work to come with this one. And then uh, one other sort of final highlight for us here um, is we helped pass a bill to affirm landowner rights to pursue native planting. So if you have an HOA or something, you have a right to plant those native plants uh, where you live in your condos, et cetera. So just a taste of all the work we accomplished in 2023. And now let's take a look at 2024. So firstly, by the numbers, um, Maine Audubon tested on, testified on 23 different bills in the second session. And adding that up with all the bills that we testified in the first session comes up to 80 bills that we testified on, which is a main Audubon record. Really exciting. And honestly, because of our ability, um, we expanded our department. Um, so we went from a full-time advocacy staffer of one to two last year. Um, and that's why we were able to do the work that we did. And we've gone back down to one as our former wonderful director of advocacy, um, Eliza Donahue, had moved on to another really wonderful role, but we're hiring again to grow back to our two person and, and hopefully one day more. Um, so more info on that toward the end of um, today's webinar. Um, so stay tuned. We also sent nearly 2000 messages to um, uh, lawmakers from Maine Audubon members and supporters throughout the session. Um, whenever there's an important moment for a bill, good or bad, um, we engage our, our action alert software um, and find out ways to get involved with our action alerts at the end of this program as well, if you wanna stay engaged, um, which is great. Again, you are the secret to our um, su successful advocacy. And then a highlight, uh, we had many petitions that we worked on and we um, created this session to help um, support our, our um, policy priorities this year, but our petition to support addressing the spread of aquatic invasive species in Maine, um, we had 941 signatures, which is great. That was uh, one of the largest petitions we've ever had in um, our history as well. So all good things. And now what I'm gonna do is take a look at half a dozen or so buckets of work that Maine Audubon um, dug into this session. I'll talk about some of the challenges and then um, we'll go from there. For second session advocacy, here are some land use planning related highlights. And backing up um, just for a moment, um, one of the, the actually currently biggest threat to wildlife is habitat loss. So Maine Audubon approaches land use planning from that lens. You know, what can we do to conserve what we have 
for wildlife in this state. And one place where we show up and we bring our expertise is into smart growth conversations. So forwarding principles that make it so that we are um, growing in thoughtful ways, you know, growing up instead of growing out. How are we developing where there's, um, how do we promote development where there is already infrastructure for people, water, sewer, et cetera? Um, how do we protect those areas of, um, you know, special um, concern for wildlife, keep those, you know, protected, et cetera? So that is, you know, really how we approach our land use planning work. Um, so highlighting quickly, one bad bill, one good bill. And there were a bunch of land use planning bills, but we're just going to kind of give you a taste of a bunch of um, in these several categories. LD 1134 would have changed the legal definition of what a subdivision is, which would have made it easier for bigger subdivisions and honestly more hastily developed subdivisions to be built and easier for them to avoid environmental review processes, which are absolutely critical smart growth principles. So right, this bill would have made it so that the size of a subdivision basically doubled and the pace at which you could build them um, was halved. Not great. We already have a problem where we're seeing lots of subdivisions in sort of sprawl in Maine in the beginning of, um, you know, this this um, this issue is getting, um, uh, it's growing and this would have increased that issue um, twofold, if not more. Um, so hats off to the wonderful chairs of the state legislature's housing committee. We sat down and we worked with them and other members of the housing committee to say, look, we know we need housing in Maine. Um, and for those of you that have been paying attention and, and seeing growth in your wherever you live and reading up on the news, according to a state survey, we need 40,000 homes to keep up with underproduction in Maine as so many people are interested in living here and want to stay here. And we also need another 40,000 to keep up um, with what we're going to see um, in terms of this continued growth by 2030. So 80,000 new homes. So there's a push to get these homes built as quickly as possible. And this bill would have done that, but this is not how Maine wants to grow. This is not why people want to come to Maine. And this will would have inevitably had um, you know, really detrimental impacts to Maine's environment. So hats off to those leaders for allowing us to sit down and talk with them and say, look, let's let's work on this together and find other other ways to advance um, development in Maine, housing development in particular. So we managed to kill this bill, which was great. Piggybacking off of that, LD 1673 is going to create a working group to coordinate collaboration among state agencies to help promote exactly what I just said, all of these smart growth principles and to look in places that are already in high use so where there's already um, that human infrastructure in place, how do we incentivize growth in those places? So we've got a good group of smart folks who will come together to think about exactly how we do that. So two big highlights from land use planning. Taking a look at some of the bills to um, some of the highlights of bills that are um, going to help protect Maine's lakes. This was a category with lots of wins for Maine Audubon and beyond. Um, and our lakes in Maine are threatened by many things. Impacts from climate, aquatic invasive species growth and the spread, um, contamination, shoreline development, disruption, erosion, all of it. Um, so a bunch of these bills that we worked on this session are going to help address many of those issues. Um, LD 1342, is a bill that's going to increase the cost of the Preserve Maine Water sticker or the Milfoil sticker, some people know it as, um, but it's a sticker that puts the whole, um, the cost of which the funds go into a fund called the Lake and River Protection Fund. And that money gets split up between the Department of Environmental Protection and the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife to help them address aquatic invasive species prevention and also um, when there are outbreaks, how to deal with the management. So um, the committee that was working on this issue, the Inland Fisheries and Wildlife Committee, um, unanimously agreed, this is a bipartisan committee, unanimously agreed this is a problem and here's a way that we can deal with it. Let's up 
let, let's support this bill. Let's up the um, cost of the stickers. So by next year, the stickers will go up by 10 bucks for in, um, in-state boats. And these stickers go on boats. I hope I might've said that at the top, but any watercraft that's going in and out of our main lakes and ponds, 10 bucks will go up for in-state folks. Out-of-staters, $15. And the committee was so committed to this issue um, that they actually increased it um, again in 2028, we'll see another bump. And this is this issue is underfunded and really largely volunteer driven. Our incredible lake organizations across the state work tirelessly to help inspect boats, to help pull milfoil and other plants um, and animals too um, that are already in lakes that have infestations. It's really grueling and intense work and just I'm I'm continually to be continue to be amazed by the volunteers in our lake orgs across the state that that do this work and they need the money to do it. So this is going to help tremendously. Really exciting win. Another bill, 2101, um, will strengthen shoreland zoning enforcement um, for towns and the land use planning commission or the LUPC. And the LUPC is the zoning and planning authority for the unorganized territories. So this is really, you know, northern, western, down east, top half of Maine. Um, so it's a really big deal. And that was something um, Maine Audubon was actually able to add the LUPC to this bill. However, it was brought forward by a wonderful um, legislator, Senator Nangle, in the sort of Wyndham area, um, who um, was approached by um, folks in his district who are dealing with egregious shoreland zoning violators. And so he came up with this bill to help us address these egregious violations. And what it does is it gives towns in the LUPC the authority to revoke or suspend permits um, for shoreland zoning permits, et cetera. And through a court process, allows them to place liens on those properties to help remediate whatever's been damaged. So trees been pulled, sand brought in inappropriately, riprap placed, all of that costs a lot of money to go back and try and fix things to where they were before. Um, so that addition was was really um, smart and I'm um, very pleased that that was able to move forward and, and with the leadership of Senator Nangle amongst others. Um, very exciting. And then the last Lake Bill, um, which I'll highlight is LD 2284 and um, if you've been following along with lake advocacy organizations or Maine Audubon, we've, we've been talking about these new high powered boats on Maine's lakes and ponds called wake boats. And wake boats uh, help folks wake surf, which is a very fun activity that um, the boats actually create really large waves so that one can surf behind the boat. Um, and you might have seen this or heard about it, um, but it's the creation of these waves, both the propulsion technology and the ballast and everything, they create these waves that are so big that they crash along the shoreline and speed up erosion at rates that we really have not seen <laughs> before, disrupting critical loon habitat, right? Loons nest right on the edge of um, lakes and ponds. So we've seen waves that big will wash over um, eggs, nests, chicks, all of it. Um, and that propulsion technology also stirs up sediment in ways that other boats don't do. Um, and it cuts vegetation, disrupts fish spawning habitat along. It's just, uh, these are tricky. It's a lot of fun, but our lakes and ponds are resources for humans and wildlife communities, right? So this bill thoughtfully addressed, okay, we want to allow for wake surfing in Maine. It's a popular activity, summer camps, et cetera, but we just have to allow it in places where it's not going to impact the environment so negatively, because again, this is a resource for all. So amongst many things within this bill, the two big takeaways that are were really core to Maine Audubon's um, um, advocacy and, and what we were hoping to see in our work with this bill was wake surfing will be restricted to, play, to um, 15 feet of water or deeper to address that um, stirring up of sediment, vegetation, cutting, et cetera. 
and also 300 feet from shore to allow a little bit more time for those really big waves to dissipate over time. So this is in line with um, our best available science, some of which say you should actually be further from the shore. Um, the depths were much closer to the best available science. Um, but this represents a really solid compromise that we were able to achieve with um, a bunch of different um, stakeholders, summer camps, industry folks, lake advocacy um, organizations, um, uh, age, um, state agency representatives, game wardens, et cetera. We landed on, on this as a, a solution amongst a couple other pieces as well within the bill, but these are the big two takeaways. All right, uh, I'm gonna move on <clears throat> to the next chunk. Um, Wabanaki studies and sovereignty highlights. Um, we were working with the Wabanaki Alliance, Maine Environmental Education Association, ACLU of Maine and others to help um, forward legislation that would have established an advisory council to evaluate how Wabanaki studies is is um, operating in Maine right now. And statutorily, we are required to teach Wabanaki studies in all Maine schools. So every Maine kiddo should go through some Wabanaki studies programming. And right now for a bunch of reasons, that's not quite happening in the ways that it should and really needs to happen. So um, that one bill that really would have established the council and, and moved things forward in a, a, a more um, sort of holistic and, and and um, comprehensive way. Didn't quite make it over the finish line. We'll get there um, toward the end of my um, highlights here. But another bill, this one, LD 1642, did make it over the finish line and it helps to modernize some of the language within the Wabanaki Studies Law. For example, it changes um, um, from Maine Native American Studies to Wabanaki Studies as just one small but mighty example, um, as well as in, includes some um, language in the bill to increase reporting measures for um, the Department of Ed Education to really evaluate how and where Wabanaki studies is being taught or isn't being taught or, or um, what is missing, et cetera. So that was good. It's a good first step. There's more to come. And then LD 2007, um, this bill, um, for those that follow along with um, throughout the, the legislative session, with other organizations as well in Maine. I'm sure you've probably heard about this bill and this was the Omnibus Tribal Sovereignty Bill. So this would have advanced the remaining um, bipartisan recommendations to modernize tribal state relations so that the Wabanaki tribes, um, we recognize their sovereignty. And it started off as that big omnibus bill and amongst um, you know leads at the Wabanaki Alliance, um, tribal leaders, and um, and others involved, deeply involved with these conversations, it it sort of shrank down to okay, let's advance these a few specific recommendations right now, and then potentially come back um, in a future session um, with some of the others. So the few that made it through were about um, amending uh, or included amendments to forward criminal justice um, jurisdiction reforms. So another really critical um, piece of the tribal sovereignty conversation, but certainly not the end of the story, not even close. Okay, two more categories, I believe, and then I'll get into some challenges. And then um, what's to look, uh, what's ahead for us. Now we're in sort of, of the wonky wins. Um, and this is really where Maine Audubon shines. You know, we have our conservation team, folks that love to get into the weeds of the laws and rules of, of how um, our natural resources are managed. And, and this is really our bread and butter and something that we um, uh, we are a resource amongst the environmental community for this kind of work. Um, so there were a bunch of bills forwarded by the Department of Environmental Protection and others to help strengthen, um, give them more tools in their toolbox to really help them do their best work. Um, so help our natural resource agencies do their best work. A bunch of bills went through, but I'm just going to highlight two. Um, LD 2058 will give the Department of Environmental Protection, the DEP, authority to reject after the fact natural resource protection, NERPA, permits, when those reject those after the fact applications, when those applicants either knew they were in violation 
when they applied, or they've got previous violations. And let me back up for just a second. What is NERPA? What is the Natural Resources Protection Act? It is one of our bedrock environmental statutes in Maine. There are, um, what NERPA does is anytime there is an impact, anytime a, a, an activity wants to, uh, excuse me, hold on, back up, it's a little wonky. Anytime anyone wants to perform an activity like dredging, development, filling, um, um, any any kind of impact, um, any kind of activity that could impact a protected natural resource, they need to get an ERPA permit through the DEP. And protected natural resources include coastal wetlands, sand dune systems, fragile mountain areas, freshwater wetlands, great ponds, lakes, streams, brooks. There's a long list, and that's most of them, but that's that's it. So this is super important and make sure that whatever activities are happening in our state, we're doing it in thoughtful ways so that we're avoiding, we're mitigating, we're minimizing, and we're compensating for any impacts to those protected natural resources. So now DEP can very quickly say, no, we are not accepting this permit from someone who was maybe um, uh, performing some sort of activity in, a protect in honor over a protected natural resource and they knew it, that's not gonna fly. And, or maybe they've got previous violations, not gonna fly. So really great, this saves the DEP time and really helps us um, protect, um, you know, forward this protection for our natural resources in the way that the law really intended. So that's great. Another example is 2253. Um, and this will give DEP the authority to issue stop work orders if a project development project is violating the rules and laws, um, our state's laws and rules um, for um, the agency. And this is great. This is another tool that the DEP absolutely should have. And and before it's more of a, a conversation gets started if, if they are either alerted to the fact that um, someone's violating laws and rules. Um, and there's a lot of time that goes by when now the DEP can say, you're done today and you have X days to fix what you've done and to show us that you've fixed what you've done and they will send a DEP staffer on site to make sure before you can move forward. And so this should, knowing that this is on the books now, this should help stop a lot of um, um, egregious and beyond sort of violations that the DEP has to wade through. Um, so it should um, theoretically and, and I think um, realistically help protect our natural resources in, in the ways that we should be in Maine. So those are two wonky ones, um, but really important. Really, really, really important. Okay, two more quick categories. Um, couple bills that were um, in our rare threatened endangered species highlights. LD 2003 did not make it past committee, which is great. Um, it would have allowed for the unlimited um, industrial harvesting of rockweed along the intertidal zone. Uh, the harvest of which of such an important wildlife resource should be done with really great care. And this bill would have allowed for industrial harvesting without land or uh, landowner permission of rockweed in the intertidal zone up and down Maine's coast. And this could have led to devastating losses for many of the critters that form the basis of the marine food chain and honestly contribute to our multi-billion dollar commercial, commercial fisheries. Um, this has impacts for humans and wildlife, and Maine Audubon approaches it too, with impacts to critical habitats for coastal birds, endangered <laughs> endangered shorebirds such as piping plovers, for example, um, least terns, and others. Um, so this was not a great bill. <laughs> this was not a great bill at all. And we, alongside many of our partners, um, who were really the the leads we're able to stop it from getting beyond committee. And um, this is a really good example of how not everybody gets to see policy making and shaping um, in uh, publicly. So if you go and you look up LD 2003 on the Maine State Legislature's website, you won't see testimony from Maine Audubon or several of the leads on this bill. And that's because we did what we do best and we worked within our existing relationships with um, agency folks, with legislators and sat down and talked to them about, you know, why, where are we coming from? Why do we think this is a bad bill? 
so that we can save us all this time and energy of this public hearing where we get up and we all say, you know, similar things that this isn't a good bill. And sometimes that is exactly what you need to do and, and have to do in order to get um, your message um, and your values across and to make your impact. But in this case, it was much better handled behind the scenes. So just a kind of an example of how policy making and shaping takes all sorts of um, twists and turns behind the scenes. Um, another bill, 2168, um, allows um, the Department of Environmental Protection to officially use recently updated statewide coastal sand dune system maps. So for the longest time, our maps of our coastal sand dunes were really, the, the mapping efforts were focused on southern half of Maine, southern to like mid coast. And that's because some of our largest sand dune systems are there, the habitats um, that, you know, we are looking to monitor and, and protect those sand dune systems for plovers, et cetera. Really, that's that's where we're seeing these birds. So for a bunch of reasons, and that's where most people live, all these reasons, we've really focused um, our mapping efforts statewide um, or at, within the um, Maine Geological Survey has focused the, the efforts on sort of just Southern Maine. And now we've got this statewide map um, that they've been working on for a while. Um, and it shows that there are sand dune systems up and down the coast, along our islands, everywhere. And this will make it so that DEP can better um, um, better regulate this, this protected natural resource. So if someone wants to build or, or um, um, renovate or something, something that's already a home that's already on the coast, but it's, you know, up in uh, northern sort of down east Maine, you know, previously a lot of folks didn't really understand where coastal sand dunes were and are and how they're supposed to be regulated and we're supposed to be using a narrative definition, but now we've got the maps and we can say, no, look, right here is where there's a sand dune. And so you can't do X, Y, Z thing that you wanna do there. Um, so it gives um, DEP just another tool, another resource to better protect that, that um, those systems. All right, looking at the time. Okay, this is truly the last category of our highlights. Plastic pollution highlights. There are a couple plastic spills, but we only had um, the capacity to engage on this one, 295. And this bill um, will call uh, calls for the DEP to explore chasing arrows issues. So that symbol that we're all very familiar with, the right, the recycling symbol, chasing arrows issues on non-recyclable packaging materials, and explore how we create incentives for companies to label packaging materials properly. So right now what we're seeing is a lot of our recycling centers are pretty inundated with material that's got the chasing arrows on it, packaging materials and others, but they're not actually recyclable and it's gumming up the system. It's costing us taxpayer money. It's, um, you know, what little can be recycled, we aren't able to because the system is, is broken. So there's some really great work happening in California to address this chasing arrows issue. Um, I believe one or two other countries right now, Canada, maybe, um, I have to check, are also working on um, chasing arrows um, issues. So what this bill is going to do is say, okay, DEP, take a look at what's already happening and see what is possible for us within existing law and where we should grow and, and, and um, implement new laws to address this issue, because it's a big one. And of course, a big threat to wildlife, of course, is plastic, marine and otherwise. All right, now I'm gonna talk just for a couple minutes about some of the challenges that we faced this session um, and then what the work ahead looks like for us. Um, so again, if you've been following along in the news or, or joining other legislative summaries from other advocacy organizations, you've probably heard that a lot of us had a lot of bills that didn't quite make it over the finish line because of budget related issues. and. I'll back up and say that happens every year, every single year, not everything gets funded. So that is not atypical. Um, so keeping that frame of reference that it it is always challenging to get your idea turned into law if it needs funding at the end of the day. So just keep that in mind. So in the first session of our 131st legislature, we've got our biannual budget that comes through. And in the second session, we've got our supplemental budget. 
And the supplemental budget really gets worked toward the end of the session, as it should, because there's a lot of bills that are coming through, getting enacted by the legislature and we're seeing, okay, should it be funded in the budget? Should it be funded? Can it be funded through existing resources? Um, is it a good bill for looking for going onto the appropriations table? That's where um, a bunch of bills go. And then whatever's unappropriated surpluses comes out of the budget process. We look there and see what we can fund. So all of those decision-making processes are happening within the Appropriations and Financial Affairs Committee at the state legislature. It's really hard work, really, really, really hard work being a member of the AFA, Appropriations and Financial Affairs Committee. Um, it's like putting together the most complicated jigsaw puzzle. And um, you've got agency folks telling you what your priorities are. You've got legislators telling you what your priorities are. You've got advocates saying, please put this thing in the budget or move this around or please fund this from the table, the administration. And all the time, these members, these leaders on the AFA committee are trying to figure out how they can really forward a budget that is in the best interest for as many people as possible. Really, really hard work to do. And unfortunately, the budget got finalized in the remaining hours of the legislative um what was really the last 99% of the legislature's work when they were supposed to adjourn, although they didn't officially quite adjourn. Um, but at 3, 4, 5 a.m., I think, was a little bleary-eyed and managed to stay for, for up until around 5 a.m. that day. Um, so because the budget wasn't finalized until really was the last thing that was worked on altogether, we didn't know how much money was left over. What is that unappropriated surplus? So unfortunately, the couple hundred bills, and that's what you're seeing this picture of right here, is um, this is the end of a the daily calendar we get when the legislature is in session. And you'll see maybe it's a little small, but special appropriations table and then those couple hundred bills, all that got sent there because they are going to all try and fight to get funded off the table, get funded by that unappropriated surplus. Um, and again, not everything gets funded because there's something like, um, you know, over more than a billion dollars worth of requests amongst these bills. And what we ended up finding out after the session, really, even though it hadn't officially ended, but after that, you know, big sort of mid-April adjournment day was that um, um, there, uh, I was losing my train of thought here, um, a bunch of these bills um, can't get funded because the work had largely ended up, uh, the legislature had largely finished their work. Um, and unfortunately, we've got um, a couple really key priority bills for Maine Audubon on this list. So bills that you might have been hearing about, and that's why I'm taking the time to really walk us through this um, wonky moment, because you might be wondering, well, what happened to that Forest Advisory Board? What happened to that open space tax reform? Um, work that Maine Audubon um, was tackling. And unfortunately, we weren't able to get them funded from the table because of the sort of later stage budget negotiations. Um, and it was unclear how they could get work from there. And there were sort of process issues, et cetera. So um, bills related to smart growth, um, that forest advisory board to help collaborate on the future of Maine's forests, Establish that Wabanaki Studies Advisory Council, which I mentioned earlier. Modernize the open space tax program. So wildlife benefiting property tax management options. That's really what that was a, something we worked on for uh, at least a year and a half. And then some other bills to address aquatic invasive species. So it's unfortunate, but all is not lost. <laughs> These bills, while they have died, the language still exists, and so many of the good leaders and legislators and folks who are behind them will be coming back to the legislature. So we're not starting from, you know, day one, zero, none of it. And we will be coming back in collaboration with many of our partners, as some of these are Maine Audubon specific forwarded, and some we've been working on in collaboration with a bunch of folks across the state. Um, so we will come back. And we'll see what, you know, who are the right champions for certain bills? Is the timing right? Do we need to, you know, change a few things? Can we fund things differently so that we don't have some of these bills ending up on the appropriations table? 
all of these conversations are happening right now and will continue to happen as we are also talking about what are some new priorities for Maine Audubon and beyond. And we do have some really good ideas. And we are working on those internal conversations, talking to our conservation staff, education staff, et cetera. So stay tuned for more information on um, some new priorities of ours. But these, many of these are coming back and we will do our very best work to get them over the finish line. Speaking of our very best work, <laughs> I just wanna quickly raise, uh, as I mentioned at the top, that we are hiring a policy advocate. So we're bringing our team back up to full-time too um, for the uh, advocacy department. You can find um, a link to that job posting at uh, mainaudubon.org backslash about backslash careers, as you can see on the slide here. And we're really looking for someone to help me do the work that I've just been talking about for the last hour. <laughs> And really, in particular, help us lead on our climate clean energy work in those buckets, amongst many, many others. But um, in particular, it'd be great if we could find somebody who could take that on for us. And the last few things, I hope you can um, stay connected with us. Subscribe to our action alerts, mainaudubon.org backslash act. That's how you can stay in the loop and make sure you're getting all the updates about different bills as they're moving forward and beyond. And our work outside of the legislative process for the state as well, there's lots of good resources and opportunities to engage with um, Maine Audubon priorities outside of the state. Follow us on our social medias and you can email us anytime um, at advocacy at mainaudubon.org. Nick and I both get those emails. So, and we're happy to respond. But I'm gonna leave it at that other than to say, thank you so much for listening, for staying engaged, for taking action, for being a part of this wildlife community with us. We cannot do it without you. And it is a huge honor. I am exceptionally grateful to do this work alongside all of you. So many, many thanks. And um, maybe we can get to some questions. Yes, thank you, Chess. Let us get to questions. If folks have questions, please put them into the Q&A box. You'd see it down on the uh, lower bar there of your screen. There is one here from Rob in Portland um, about the, the wake boat bill. Are there lakes where wake boats are prohibited, he asks. Great question, Rob. Um, technically, no, in that, you know, there's no list where certain lakes and certain ponds you can't wake surf. Um, but the way the legislation is written, there will be some ponds, especially, but really small lakes where wake surfing really won't be allowed um, because they won't meet the depth and the shoreline requirements. And to be totally frank, too, it's not fun to do in shallow water <laughs> and in small uh, lakes and ponds either. You really want that deeper um, water anyways. And that's what we heard from industry folks and, and, and summer camps and others that enjoy the activity so that it all should work out um, fine in that way. Um, but we'll see how things un unfold. But yeah, right now, no official list of thumbs up, thumbs down for wake surfing. All right, I see no additional questions, um, but I want to thank Chess for all her great work. I want to thank those who attended today. We will put this video up online and we'll be back at it next year. Great, thanks, everybody. Year. That's right. That's right. Take Have care, everyone.